Hirsch. Welcome back to a new season of EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. After decades of isolation from the U.S., Cuba is once again welcoming Americans to its beaches, restaurants, cultural attractions, and perhaps its schools. This tiny island with its meager economy has an amazing success story. Nearly 100% of its citizens are literate. In 2011, I visited Cuba as part of an educator's tour. Since then, Cuba has become even more accessible. In the summer of 2015, a group of faculty from Hostos Community College visited Cuba. They met with Cuban educators and public health officials to talk about and share practices and challenges. Today, two colleagues on that trip joined me for a candid conversation about Cuba today and what these educators learned from each other. guests today are Professor Elise Vasquez Iscon of the Education Department at Ostas Community College and Professor Lisa Tappener, the librarian in charge of collection development and technology. Welcome to EdCast and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. I'm aware that Cuba has a very high literacy rate um, that's become very public knowledge and I know that you went with Ostas faculty this summer on a trip to visit Cuba. Tell us a little bit about that trip, why you went, what was the focus, who went? Um, well, the trip was organized by our Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, at the time, it was headed up by Professor Nelson Nunez Rodriguez, who is Cuban. Um, and he um, put together a faculty development <coughs> seminar with Lourdes Torres, our grants officer. Um, and they just put out a call for participation for all faculty adjunct mm -hmm. and full-time, and I think HEOs were also um, included in the call for participation. How many people ended up going? I'm um, about 16. <coughs> and <coughs> from <coughs> what aspects, what areas of the college were people from? We had humanities, we had the business um, program, um, education, librarians, um, uh, sociology, Dental hygiene. Dental hygiene. It was nicely multidisciplinary. We also had our president, the college president went, and we were accompanied by our former, the former director of the um, Hostos Center for Arts and Culture, Wally Edgecombe, who grew up in Cuba. Oh, so you had quite a diverse group of people. Yes. How long were you there? We were there for about 20 days. Yep. And where did you go? Well, the tour was, or the trip was mostly centered in Havana. Mm -hmm. We stayed um, at the same hotel the whole time um, and studied at the same center. We'll talk about that mm -hmm. later. Um, and then on the weekends, we had free time. So I went, um, I think it was just overnight, to Vinales in, um, in western Cuba. Um, some of us went to day trips to other places, but mostly it was centered in Havana. Mm -hmm. You were <laughs> part of a faculty development seminar, so tell us just as an overview, what were some of the topics that you were examining while you were there? Well, we looked at issues of remediation in academia. How does Cuba deal with um, its student population that needs remediation? Um, we also looked <coughs> at faculty development. What requirements are in place for um, academics teaching um, in Cuba? And in contrast, you know, we had a knowledge base of what we required in the U.S. So it was interesting to compare and mm -hmm. contrast differences. Now, um, is, tell us a little bit about just some education background in Cuba. Is education required? What are the ages of, of going to school? Right, so education is compulsory from the first grade, which is primary school, up until the ninth grade, which is considered secondary. Preschool, um, anywhere from uh, six months to the age of five is not compulsory, and neither is it after the 10th grade. And are there any costs involved in education? No, it's universal. No. All universal. the way through college. All the way through college. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit later about college and how it's not available to everybody, but it's free. Okay, so right. let's talk pedagogy, which we love to do on EdCast, yes. right? Um, what are some of the pedagogical principles that you found undergird education in Cuba and possibly the great success that Cuba has in terms of educating its population? Well, um, Cuba prides itself on having um, education that prepares people not just to work 
into the workforce, but also to be better um, citizens in humanity, to be patriotic, to have values. Uh, the educational system instills in them value and the appreciation of labor. And this is seen in their activities on a weekly basis where students are um, given two hours every week of value education. Um, and they're also um, required to participate in labor activities, not for um, profit, but mm -hmm. just to instill in them the love of education. So they have um, gardens <clears throat> that they participate in, and they also repair a lot of the uh, furniture in the schools. They mend a lot of the books, and this keeps the, defrays the cost of education, but it also teaches them about, as a community, working and the love of work. That's a very positive thing, actually. Um, in terms of values, I know people are thinking, and I know I was thinking, because it comes up here in the United States also, how do you teach values? I mean, do you just say this is the, I know you're, by actually doing the work, you are teaching a value of doing work, a value of collaboration, a value of not taking things for granted. But in general, how else do you see they are teaching values in a way that we might want to emulate? One thing that struck me was the sense that um, democracy was very important, that the student voice as well as the professor's voice, the teacher's voice was valued in the classroom. Um, they talked about teaching students how to solve problems together and communicate um, respectfully with one another. Um, so things that you don't necessarily hear about in terms of what happens in a classroom in the United States is sort of important in how they um, manage their classrooms and the I think that's a value of, of communicating, instilling, collaboration, a spirit of working together. I've never heard it put in quite that way, and I'm already thinking to myself, well, democracy, that's a kind of irony in a certain way, yes. because it's certainly not <laughs> I know, I a democratic, that. democratically run country. So that's something we're going to get back to. And right. I have to say that on my trip to Cuba, I was aware of that as well. There is a lot of attention paid to democracy. And yet, we're not, most people would say Cuba is not a democracy. So we're really going to have to talk about, I hope later, about how they kind of reconcile those things in a way that makes sense to the people who are participating. I think it must be difficult. Now, faculty development in terms of education mm -hmm. is a big issue in the United States right now. How should teachers be prepared? Our teacher education programs are taking big hits that they're not really preparing teachers adequately and in the right way. What did you notice about teacher preparation in Cuba that you think is worth emulating or that was just interesting to you? Um, well, the one thing is that the status of educators is much higher. Okay. They are highly regarded um, and they are seen as professional and they are paid commensurate with other professionals. Um, they have uh, an extensive amount of pre-service training prior to becoming educators and they have continuous support during their career. Um, they create these um, communities that are called pedagogical communities mm -hmm. for each discipline. So um, as these communities come together every month, they discuss challenges in, the, in their field and they work together in arriving to solutions in how to better implement um, the curriculum. Innovation is awarded also, mm -hmm. which is very interesting because you would think that in a repressive society, mm -hmm. being an innovator is not really something Thing that is looked upon highly, but they are rewarded for being innovators. I want to say at the outset that Cuba is an anomaly in many ways. When you visit Cuba, you are really struck by how it's a bundle of contradictions yes. that makes it not seem so repressive when you're there in terms of other repressive countries where you feel it. You well, really don't feel it that much in Cuba, so right. it must be because of these different approaches. It's, it's an interesting, that's why we're going to go visit. Um, <laughs> I, I, one thing that struck me also was that um, for, te for training teachers who are, say, scientists or who are not educators but are, work are in the <coughs> disciplines, um, there are teams of ped pedagogical specialists and then subject specialists who come together and work together to kind of make a program, a pedagogical program for, for a specific discipline. I thought that was really interesting. For all grades? For This is higher for higher education. This is this for higher ed? For higher education. Okay. That that, right. Right. And yep. then, well, in secondary and primary, primary and secondary education, what they have is community um, of educators. And these communities are composed of teachers, mm -hmm. um, depending on the level, and they develop and design um, any issues that they, they find in the classrooms. Do they watch each other teach? Do they visit each other? Do you know? I don't know if they sure. visit each other, but I'm thinking that because they're so supportive and they provide ongoing support mm -hmm. throughout their career, it's not just we're training you, now you're going <coughs> to go off, right. be dispatched into the classroom and you're on your own. It's a continuous process. Yeah, you do get the sense that they are kind of revisiting their te teaching practice as so a group. So in the U.S., you know, we've had this approach 
currently. Uh, we're, we really curtailed the amount of time teachers need to prepare to teach. They could go to a program like Teach for America or the New York City Teaching right. Fellows and really get into the classroom with minimal preparation. And I know we're rethinking that, but what would be the approach in Cuba to getting a teacher ready to teach? Well, they have to spend a whole summer of pre-service before entering the, the classroom. And um, they do weekly um, trainings as a community. So every week they come together. And they're do they required. apprentice like a student teacher, or do they go right into? Well, they, they do apprentice as, mm -hmm. as a pre-service. Mm -hmm. And then during their first year of teaching, they are kind of an auxiliary um, right. mm -hmm. in the classroom. And then once they have mastered certain aspects, then they're given their own classroom. But even then, because they're part of that teaching community, um, they go in there and they express their challenges. And it's based on this community is composed of different um, levels of educators. So you have the more senior ones providing advice mm -hmm. to the more um, newer ones. Going back to what Lisa said about higher ed, in the United States, most of our professorial rank teachers don't really get pedagogical development. Right, right. What's important is that you know the content, I mm -hmm. guess. So what did you think of that approach? I, I mm -hmm. definitely got the impression that they are trained as teachers as well as being experts in their subject and that they're working with people who are pedagogical experts all the time, you know, to refine their teaching, to talk about do, new methods mm -hmm. of teaching, to look at um, outcomes mm -hmm. assessment. We talked a little bit about that. Um, yeah. So no, I think they, they see their mm -hmm. role as not just a subject specialist, but also as, as educators and, and teachers. And this is regardless if they're going to become professors. Um, their rationale is that even if you don't step into the classroom, you're going to be a mentor, you're going to be a supervisor. Oh, right. So right. you need to mentor the next coming generation, so you need to have those pedagogical skills. You had the opportunity to meet with many people in Cuba, and one of the educators that you met was a Ana Sanchez. And she talks a little bit about the Cuban philosophy behind education, so let's take a look. Para mí la educación es como es depositar en todo ser humano toda la obra que le ha antecedido. Es ponerlo a la altura de su tiempo. Con esto quiero decir que la educación tiene un carácter histórico concreto. Está influenciada por el desarrollo que ha alcanzado las que ha alcanzado las fuerzas productivas, que ha alcanzado la ciencia, la técnica. Todo ello repercute en la educación. Pero para mí educar no es solamente transmitir conocimiento, es también es transmitir, o sea, sentimientos, valores. Y creo que en estos momentos que vivimos de tanta materialidad y que no podemos olvidar que estamos en medio de una crisis sistémica. Y cuando hablo de crisis sistémica, que esa crisis se manifiesta en toda la esfera de la vida, social. Estamos siendo testigos de una profunda crisis económica que ha afectado a muchos países de Europa. Los propios Estados Unidos de América también han sido afectados por esa crisis económica que ha traído como consecuencia también una crisis en el plano político, en el plano ideológico. Hasta, hay hasta una crisis alimentaria porque no cabe duda que estamos viviendo momentos bien difíciles de un profundo cambio climático y si los hombres y las mujeres no cuidamos de la naturaleza vamos a tener que sufrir mucho porque realmente estamos dilapidando muchas de las riquezas naturales por eso pienso que para mí la educación no solamente es instrucción es también transmitir sentimientos, valores y sobre todo amor. Creo que estamos viviendo en una época tan rápida, tan dinámica, que a veces mmm, se nos olvida hasta nuestros seres más queridos decirles o, o al menos manifestarles lo que significa, cuánto significa para uno y sobre todo manifestarles nuestro amor. Eh, para mí la educación es también la base de todo desarrollo social porque en la medida que un pueblo es mejor educado pues está preparado de una forma 
más coherente para enfrentar cada reto, para enfrentar los avatares que nos impone la vida. Cuba no cabe duda que tiene una obra en el plano educacional que, eh, que mostrar, una obra que nos ha hecho que siendo un país un país de América Latina subdesarrollado, porque no podemos, siempre tenemos que recordar que Cuba es un país que no tiene grandes recursos naturales y sin embargo nuestra mayor riqueza es precisamente el capital humano. Y cuando hablo de capital humano estoy hablando de los profesionales y de los hombres y mujeres que aún aquellos que no han obtenido una profesión, un título universitario, sí tienen determinados mmm, enraizados, no en sí tiene determina, eh, eh, determinados logros de nuestra educación. Y esa educación es la que ha permitido, a mi modo de ver, que el pueblo cubano haya sido capaz de enfrentar tantos retos en todas las esferas, en todas las esferas de la vida. Hoy no cabe duda que el, o sea, el Estado cubano está preocupado por el desarrollo de la educación, tanto es así que aproximadamente el 25% del presupuesto anual se le destina a la educación. What most impressed you about what Ana Sánchez said? I think what impressed me the most is that she doesn't see education just a transmission of knowledge. She sees it as an opportunity to engage students into becoming better human beings. Um, she believes that values is an uh, instilling values in, in students is an opportunity to um, create the next generation of professionals that are giving back to society um, and that are productive, creating a society that's productive and well-rounded. How did you feel this reconciled with our concepts of education here? Well, it was inter I have a little story yeah. um, that, um, about her. Um, we gave a talk, Elise and me and another um, professor, Sandy Figueroa, um, about sort of how things run at Ostos. And mm -hmm. my, my section was on um, educational technology. So I had a, a slideshow with all the different ways that technology exists in our campus. Um, And the question she asked me was not about using technology, you know, as uh, pedagogic, pedagogical methods, but she said, well, what, what kind of values are you transmitting um, through all this technology? And it was Sit just... up and pay attention. Yeah, well, kind <laughs> of, right? Or, or gadgets are fun, or, yeah. you know, what are the values uh -huh. that we are instilling? We have, we have so much, so many resources. But what are the you know what kind of what what values are going along with those resources? And I think there's some great values. What was your answer to that? Well, I was a little tongue-tied because okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, well, certainly my first thought was more is better. You know, the, and and cer you know I work in a library where there's a lot of demand for technology, and we'd like to have more of it. You know, there's not mm -hmm. enough. Um, but also, I think there's also the question of what what are we using that technology for? Do we have to keep remembering it's to to be educated, at least in our context. Mm -hmm. and, and as Elise says, I think sometimes we might lose track of um, using technology to be better citizens, using technology to be better people. How, how do we use technology in the service of becoming well-rounded individuals? But it was just, it was such a thought-provoking question that she asked. I get email every day about technology in education. And I'm going to think if I've seen a discussion about how to use technology to become better people. I'm yeah. going to go through it all over again. I, mean, I, I think cannot think that I've seen something yeah. where that has been. There's so many issues raised about how much and how it relates to actual genuine learning and how students read. Do they read better with technology, without? But I never see, or I hate to say never, but I don't recall seeing too much about how to be a better person via technology. That's very interesting. She also has, says a figure that caught my attention. She said the Cubans spend 25% of their budget on education. That's very high. I mean, I thought the figure was somewhat lower. I know they spend more than the U.S. in terms of budget, but can you tell us what you thought of those figures? Were those correct? Right. So um, <clears throat> when, when I further um, research the allocation of funding for education, I focus more on the gross domestic product, and mm -hmm. I compared it between the U.S. And, and Cuba. And what it 
I found is that it's actually, Cuba's is uh, double of mm -hmm. the U.S. Cuba's roughly about 12%, <laughs> whereas the U.S. allocates its gross domestic product to 7% for education. Um, and that's a pretty significant difference. Um, when you look at all other factors, the population, it's an island nation. We are, mm -hmm. you know, um, a much bigger um, population and country, yet we only allocate 7% of our gross domestic product now to I education. Now, let's go back to something uh, uh, about education itself and pedagogy. She referred to education being more than the transmission of knowledge or the transmission of information. But that very concept of education being the transmission of knowledge is a controversial one here in the United States, or it's certainly one that we talk about, and that is the approach to education being transmission of knowledge or construction of knowledge. Mm -hmm. In other words, do we want students to receive information, and that would be the lecture format, or do we want them to make meaning for themselves? And so we would call that a constructivist approach versus the transmission model here in the United States. What was your feeling about the pedagogical approaches in Cuba? Is it transmission of information, or is it a more student-centered constructivist approach? I think that education in Cuba um, the way they see it is that education is not just knowledge or information, but it's a celebration of past accomplishments and also a way to prepare students to navigate in society and to address life's challenges in a positive way. Um, when we look at education in the United States, we're looking at when students get a degree, it's so that they can go on and get a job. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that they're gonna be able to navigate through hardships and life challenges? It just means that they'll be able to get a job. And once they're unemployed, what happens? How do they handle those hardships? How do they handle navigating through um, obstacles in life? Not well. Not well. <laughs> Not no. that well. So you think they pay more attention to something like that? Yes. Lisa? So we studied um, at a place called the um, Center for Sancha de Estudios Martianos. So it's, it was based, it's based on the work and thought of Jose Marti, who's a, um, a Cuban philosopher. He was a patriot. <coughs> he died um, fighting against the Spanish. Um, and he wrote a lot about education and sort of education in terms of building a nation. I mean, he was fighting for an independent Cuba. Um, and so I think a lot, of, and this is an Ana Sanchez runs that, that center, so I think a lot of her philosophy is sort of based on the philosophy of, of, of Jose Marti. And so that, that was definitely what he, um, what he advocated for, was sort of being educated in order to become a citizen, being educated in order to um, be in service of the nation. Um, and also, he was a poet, and he was a literary person. So he he believed in you know education as as building a well-rounded person who had a um, who, who used their creativity in service of solving problems, um, who enjoyed the life of the mind. How important did you think the arts were in terms of education in Cuba? Very important. Yes. And in what way was that manifested? Um, well, you see a lot of cultural centers abounding around the. Uh, different communities that we visited, which I thought was really interesting because when you think of communism, you think of repression, you don't think of expression, especially artistic expression. Mm -hmm. When we were there, we had the fortune um, opportunity to um, experience the um, biennial art exhibit. And this is an exhibit that is open to the public. And to me, what floored me was to see that this was art display for the masses. Now, when you think of art. All over art, the streets of Cuba. Exactly. Just, it was open. It was, covered it was indoor, Havana. Yeah. but it was also out on display in different open street areas. When we think of art and we think of who goes to art exhibits mm -hmm. and who goes to museums in the United States, here in New York City. It's very elite. It's very elite yes. and mm -hmm. it's very exclusionary. And what was that art like? I know I can hear the thoughts of people watching and saying, well, was it all about propaganda? Because a lot of, you know, when you travel throughout Cuba, it's clear that a lot of the artwork yes. that you see is about Che and about Fidel. And so tell me about the art. I I was surprised. I mean, I was surprised at how political the art was. There was, it was a, political. It was political. I mean, mm -hmm. not all of it, mm -hmm. um, but but it was very. And there was a lot of reference to U.S.-Cuba relations. I and mean, we were there at a time when. What was that like? Um, well, it well, I thought it was pretty sophisticated. Right. You know, there's it was. Um, you know, American flags and Cuban flags and old newspaper um, clippings, you know, our history, our long history together, our fraught mm. history. Um, but not just a kind of an embrace of American culture, but also not a complete rejection of, the, right. of American culture. I thought that there was sort of a, a lot of the art dealt with the Cuban 
American relationship and um, our past and also maybe our future. As was the art abstract or express? I mean, if you oh, don't it, want it to get diverse. that technical, but um, yeah. it was very diverse. There, there were various mediums. Um, you know, I actually was very. Um, um, I guess I gravitated towards this one photo exhibit that was on the street, and it was a comparison of Havana and Miami. And there were pictures of similar areas in Miami that kind of resemble similar areas in Havana, mm -hmm. from the architecture, from just the, um, the beachfront. And so it was kind of a way of showing through photograph that there are similarities, even mm -hmm. geographically, between Havana and Miami. It's not just that, you know, that's where there's a large Cuban diaspora, mm -hmm. but, you know, there is a lot of commonality there. Um, but there was also a lot of abstract art. Now, we're running out of time, and I am going to ask you to stay and continue with us for a part two, because we have not even really looked at higher education and public health, and two very key things that I do want to talk to you about. So before we go today, could you each just tell me one thing that impressed you the most about about what you saw in terms of education in Cuba that you think we can learn from. Lisa, what did you think? Well, to return to the art theme. Okay. So there was art everywhere you went in Havana when we were there. And what, what I loved was you had these little kids going and reading the artist statements that were sort of plastered here and there. So little kids interested in art, interested in kind of understanding. And they the, could read. And one, they could read. <laughs> yeah. And these were not, I mean, these were not upper class kids. Uh -huh. They were kids who were modestly dressed, mm -hmm. you know, with their family out on the Malecon on a, mm -hmm. a Friday night. And, but they were interested in those ideas and they looked at the art. And I thought that an education system in a society produced that sort of curiosity and openness to ideas and art. So that struck me. Um, for me, what I took away as very important is that education is a community responsibility. It's not just um, falls in the arms of the teachers. The family, the community are all responsible. So it's a communal effort versus an independent venture. Thank you both so much for joining us. I hope you will come and stay and talk a little bit more for our part two of the show about Cuba and education today. Elise Vasquez Iscon, Lisa Tappener, both from Hostos Community College, thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Don't go away, we'll be right back with our Ed Bites. <music> Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. The American Academy of Pediatrics will be revising their guidelines regarding children and their exposure to electronic and online media. Currently, they recommend no screen time at all for children under two years old and advise parents to model sensible online behaviors. No drastic changes seem likely, but the association will draw on the latest research to enable parents and caregivers to make the best choices regarding children and media. The new guidelines are expected in October 2016. New research indicates that boys are still falling behind girls in academic achievement. They graduate from high school and attend college at lower rates and are more likely to get into trouble. Social scientists now think they have an explanation for this gender gap. Boys seem more sensitive than girls to disadvantage. Negative circumstances such as growing up poor, living in a bad neighborhood, or being fatherless affect them more than girls. Based on these findings, educators and policymakers are looking at ways of devising more positive outcomes for boys. That's it for this edition of EdCast. Till next time, class dismissed. <laughs>